my name is Boris Surinsky, I'm a contact lens uh, specialist from Atlanta, Georgia, working with Emory University. And today we will be discussing our approaches to specialty lens fitting after corneal collagen cross-linking. Uh, just most of you definitely know the long history of cross-linking being around for at least last 20 years. And unfortunately, it took almost 20 years for the procedure to be approved here in the U.S., but it finally was approved in 2016. And uh, the device that in use right now utilizes the uh, EPIOF cross-linking technique uh, 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 and delivered by Avedra KXL systems. So, why cross-linking? It's uh, definitely the first line treatment for progressive keratoconus, uh, any, type, any other types of corneal ectasia like lucid partial deterioration and everything that's related to, to post-refractive surgery, ectasia. Uh, cross-linking actually not only helps the progression but also may improve corneal measurements, decreasing stiffness and aberrations, and can actually prevent the loss of best correcting vision that we will talk about it later. Uh, trying to avoid by any means the need in uh, penetrative keratoplasty uh, and, and gaining again functional vision with contact lenses. This is basically the up-to-date uh, treatment protocol for, for cases of uh, progressive, progressive keratoconus. And again, anything that could be done to prevent corneal transplant, especially in young patients, uh, definitely will be more than welcome. So uh, I just wanted to give some definitions for the progression analysis in, in cases of, uh, of progressive keratoconus. So as, as, as most of you know, we define the progression of the change in uh, corneal and refractive astigmatism of more than one diopter. Again, it's very in between the studies. Some studies say even uh, 0.5 diopter of, of, of change uh, will be considered as a progression. Uh, or again, change in maximal K readings more than one diopter. So to do our scans properly, of course, the patient has to stop their contact, habitual contact lens correction uh, at least two or three days earlier to prior to scanning in this case they're using any type of self contacts and definitely more for rigid, so maybe scleral lenses. So I just want, wanted to go through this uh, corneal changes over a period of almost four years and just wanted to emphasize that Basically, when cross-linking is not done at time, patients are losing their best corrective vision. So as you can see here, the refractive astigmatism progress from 275 diopters to almost six diopters, definitely losing best corrected vision with spectacles and still gaining good vision with an RGP contact lens. And patient again, a patient was offered cross-linking for a number of times, but for some reason they denied it and then they came finally in in, in four years ago after first recommendation we had done having decreased vision even using rgp contact lenses and uh, as, as you may see definitely there's some evidence uh, evidences of evolving apical scarring which actually precludes good corrected vision so what does cross linking it's basically increases the stiffness of keratoconic cornea and there is some evidence in that keratoconic cornea actually softer than a normal cornea and that's actually why uh, all it, the, everything that is associated, associated with eye rubbing or increased AOP may be a trigger to, to keratoconus starting to progress. So cross-linking will definitely compensate for this for this weakness. And some studies saying that the biomechanical stiffness actually increases by almost a factor of 1.5, which is definitely significant. Uh, just again as a reminder, uh, per 
a withdraw or a, vapor, uh, a baby of a day protocol prohibits us we cannot cross link corneas below 400 microns uh worrying about possible intertelial damage but there is some tricks that we can but that we can do contact lens assisted uh cross linking especially on young and young patients with keratoconus and corneal sickness below than 400 and we'll talk about it a bit later so regular dressing protocol again as accepted here in the US it's corneal abrasion about eight to nine millimeters uh usage of riboflavin 20 percent external solution and then irradiation for 30 minutes so it's many other devices as most of you know maybe using them already as uh, accelerated cross-linking procedure or uh, uh, pulsed with uh, additive oxygen or cross-linking procedure, but the idea is basically the same to cross-link this cornea and just basically the new technique may shorten the uh, time needed for, for uh, treating to be done. Now, why it's so important, because our topic is not really cross-linking, but how to fit contact lenses up for the cross-linking. Uh, the cornea definitely won't stay in the same shape after cross-link. So first week it takes, it's like about to be four days to about a week to the cornea to repetalize itself. And then, and we actually were very surprised at the beginning, started doing cross-linking like uh, 10, 12 years ago, why some of the corneas get actually steeper in a few months after cross-linking. And, 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 and definitely explained by, by the, Epithelial changes uh, going on after revitalization with all the remodeling. So basically, in the first months, we probably seen kind of a bare cornea, and then as the epithelial covers the, the gap in between the stiffest and the flattest points, you probably seeing normalization of case, or in some cases, even significant flattening of the cornea. Again, I think it's emphasizes very, very nicely as the steep case changing throughout the, the over the time and seeing some, some flattening effect of almost two diopters and actually best corrective vision also improves as the cornea gets flatter. But again, it may take in other passing actually, as in this case we're seeing kind of steeper case by almost of two diopters uh, about a month after the procedure. And if you'll be looking at this corneal, this hypertrophic epithelium that uh, just, it, it's exactly the process of the re remodeling uh, just covers the gaps in between the, 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 the corneal apex. And then again, after four months, basically cornea just came to the same pre-surgical measurements, as you may see, it's also an improvement in the best, best corrected visual acuity. Another type of changes is corneal regularization, when possibly the steeper point of the cornea, the, the apex gets a little bit flatter from the other hand, because being, uh, it's still in elastic tissue as the steep K gets flatter, probably the flat K gets a little bit steeper, as you can see over here, but it actually all helps to, and again, this is very extreme case, when patient came from 5.5 day of the astigmatist to oh, just slightly above one, having an increase in the, in the spherical component, which basically, if you'll be looking at the spherical equivalent, it's very much the same, but his spectacle corrected vision C proof significantly to 20 over 25. Uh, why again, why should we be careful with contact lenses after cross link? And it's, it, it's all about changes to the corneal epithelium and, and uh, trying not to interrupt this normal uh, process of changes. Uh, after in the first few months of, after the cross link. So uh, in, 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 in many cases, uh, we may actually disrupt the CPTL remodeling. And again, the question again, when it will be the most appropriate time 
to start with contact lenses. And most of the complications probably will happen in more steeper corneas, and which definitely makes sense. The steeper the apex, the more regularly the surface probably will take longer to the epithelium to get to its normal thickness and it goes through the remodeling process. So again, here comes the question about contact lenses. Should we, when should we start it and can we do more damage rather than benefit to, to, to the cornea to just recover, recovering after the procedure? So basically even so, keratoconus is considered not an inflammatory disease, but there is definitely some degree of chronic inflammation in keratoconic cornea, uh, both from contact lens induced microtrauma and, 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 and micro erosions to patient related eye rubbing, which also takes place very, very often, and to the toxic effect by, by contact lens solutions. So all this may, even without going to, to through the cross link process, may cause dry eyes uh, and, and compromise corneal epithelium. Uh, there is also some uh, damage that actually may happen from the procedure itself because you will like, you will like be toxic to corneal epithelial. So uh, everything will basically lead to some degree of uh, an irregular or, or irregular epithelium or some delay in epithelial healing, which is again it's crucial for for normal rehabilitation and a remodeling process to, to uh, basically taking this cornea to the normal healings after the procedure. And again, the question that ask what should we do with the contact lenses and how the contact lens influence over the cornea may actually uh, disrupt this normal remodeling effect. And now going again just through basic types of contacts we will be speaking today uh, from rigid gas permeable contacts which have been around for last 70 years, a uh, little less probably 60, 60, 65 to more newer designs as corneoscleral contact lenses, or so limbal lenses, hybrid lenses special soft lenses for keratoconus and definitely scleral contact lenses. Uh, so going back a little bit to history, corneal spherical lenses, rigid lenses were the gold standard for many, many years. They consist of base curve and uh, uh, which take, takes place at the center part of the lens followed by a series of peripheral curves that uh, help with alignment, to help, helping to align the lens over the corneal periphery and the edge lift that helps with the tear exchange. But is it still the gold standard? And we will see it a bit, a little bit later. So there's a few fitting approaches to rigid contacts uh, in, in keratoconus. The most probably the most, most common, most common, the most known one is the three-point touch approach. And the second one is apical clearance, which was developed slightly later after uh, the CLEC study results were published. So again, in, in both of these approaches, we are trying to spread contact lens weight over the healthy peripheral cornea, where the corneal thickness is normal, and trying to avoid any excessive contact with corneal center due to, again, thinner stromal uh, component and definitely more irregular and also senior epithelium. And again, why CLEX study results are so important, they definitely show that uh, corneal touch of flat fitted lenses are very highly associated with degree in the appearance of corneal scarring. So again, this is not something that you will like to see when you fit your post cross corneal cross link patients. Uh, excuse me. So there's some advantages of, and disadvantages to any of these designs. So again, the three-point touch may definitely lead to slightly better visual acuity 
tall scar cornea because of the compaction effect. And from the other hand, we definitely will see higher rate of contact lens induced uh, erosions, which may lead later to fibrosis and corneal scar formation. And again, speaking about cross-linking, uh, most of these factors may will lead to some degree of epithelial damage and interrupt epithelial remodeling after, after the procedure. So minimal apparel clearance is definitely a better approach. Uh, when we feed cross-linked corneas, again, trying to avoid any, any epithelial compaction disruptions or erosions. And most of these approaches, we can define it as an apical clearance, maybe very, very physical uh, apical touch, but still no, cor no heavy corneal bridge and contact to the full uh, apical clearance. Large geometer rigid contacts may actually work better in both patient compact, excuse me, patient comfort and, 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 and lens stabilization decreasing basically lens movement and again it's definitely logical the as we go and increase the lens diameter we decrease this what's called the lead attachment effect so the lens stays relatively more stable and less it moves uh disrupts the epithelium less and again in corneal scalar contacts we can also uh decrease or increase corneal vaulting making this lens to be looking almost like a scleral lens with its uh, limbal support. So again, this lens can be designed better to avoid any possible corneal touch. Piggyback, it's actually, sometimes it's a well forgotten technique with all the new scleral and hybrid lens developments, but it still may be working pretty well in cases of keratoconus in both improving rigid lens centration because basically the soft lens acts like a bandage and due to its thickness uh, will kind of smoother the surface, decreasing the degree of corneal irregularity. And from the other hand, again, due to the bandage effect, it also prevents any possible rubbing to the surface or desiccation associated with uh, uh, edge lift of rigid contact lenses. Uh, sometimes it's definitely this pros and cons to everything. So some patients are not really ready to work with using two lenses a day. And in cases, the rigid lens still won't center very, very well over the cornea, like the, this picture down below, we will be actually inducing more of a coma-like, coma-type high order operations, which will uh, create uh, some reduction in visual acuity due to uh, ghosting or double imaging. Uh, one of the solutions to overcome the centration uh, problem in 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 in, in it's a pocket lens carrier or what's called a pillow lens. So it's basically soft carrier uh, with a little pocket created into it, and then rigid lens can fit exactly in between. So again, everything should be designed. You definitely should know the, the, the size, the diameter of your pocket to design the, the rigid lens. And in terms of vision, it definitely works better because it's definitely way more centered. From the other hand, the soft carriers mostly done in HEMA style of materials, which decreases the oxygen permeability to the cornea because the rigid lens also will be losing its pumping mechanism so it, because it won't really have a good edge lift sitting inside of the pocket it won't create any tear pumping fenestration help a little bit but again this type of a carrier is very often associated with uh, neovascularization and and decreased sparing times and going again to our topic of contact lens fitting after corneal crosslink. So again, we talk a little bit about epithelial remodeling and changes to the epithelium throughout the first months. There was a very interesting study in British Journal of Telomology in 2014. It actually, the study uh, studied uh, basal plexus uh, epithelial nerves uh, density in cross-linking eyes, cross-linking eyes wearing 
rigid contacts, and they actually found a decrease in basal and epithelial cells and neuroplex density. Uh, and they claim that it probably comes again from rigid lens compression and rubbing effect. Uh, and as we know, the cornea also may remain hyperesthetic for the three or even six months after proselyte. So all it may lead to uh, disrupted revitalization mechanism and having this hyperesthetic cornea may possibly also increase the risk of contact lens related microbial keratitis. And again, speaking about rigid lens fitting after corneal surgery, there was a study back in 1999 by Zadnik et al. that said that in case of PRK, they usually waited about three to four months for rigid contacts to be fitted, uh, trying to avoid any possible complications. So in terms of corneal recovery, there's basically no difference in between PRK and post cross link because the revitalization process is basically the same. But in case of keratoconus, it also uh, makes the serialization maybe take longer or being more difficult because of the nature and shape of the cornea. So this is one of our patients that uh, underwent a very successful cross-link in his left eye and was advised to seize any contact lens barrel and of course he started doing his rigid all the rigid contacts about two weeks after uh, cross-linking and he developed a central corneal ulcer probably again it's possibly it's thought to be related to contact lens rubbing effect uh, causing some abrasions and then ulcer happened so this uh nice looking cornea after cross-link turned out to be this corneal scar in the center, which definitely diminished patient's visual acuity. And speaking very, very briefly about CLEC study results, uh, rigid lens used by CLEC study almost, almost in double the risk of corneal scarring. So what can we do on our end, trying to decrease contact lens mechanical impact or the recovering cornea. Uh, we, we, we will talk now a little bit more on, on newer types, newer designs like special lenses, soft lenses, after keratoconus hybrids, and definitely scleral lenses, which evolved very dramatically during the last 10 15 years. Okay, and we'll go to our first question now. So, uh, when we're talking about Few first months after course linking, uh, what would you recommend? Uh, will you recommend rigid contact lens to start immediately with rigid contacts? Uh, should you take more greater precautions to avoid any epithelial damage between contacts? And the short, if you do recommend tactical touch fitting. Uh, to help this, uh, to help this corneal remodeling. So, absolutely yes. The correct answer will be B. Uh, we will definitely need to take more precautions fitting for rigid contacts uh, or any type of contacts after after cross link just to avoid any possible epithelial damage. So, uh, as we said, we are trying maybe to avoid rigid contacts, so maybe feeding it more on the piggyback type, but we still can use what's called the conventional uh, contacts after cross link, and it might be toric lens, it might even be spherical lens when the keratoconus is mostly inferior, uh, keeping the visual axis uh, almost undistorted in tapes in, in, in cases of form frost keratoconus, very, very mild cases. But uh, the, the key point that if you can refract this patient to 2040, 2030 visual acuity, uh, just with your refraction, uh, you should try conventional lens first. Very often you will be surprised how good vision could be 
And again, uh, if you can keep your, especially young patient from using more specialty type of contacts, it will just improve their quality of life because these people, they really want to be like anybody else using maybe not glasses, but regular contacts to get better vision and not going into sclerosis hybrid or whatsoever when it makes all the process more complex and bulky. So uh, in my opinion, stiffer silicon hydrogel will work better because of the, again, corneal regularization, regularization effect from the stiffness of the material itself. So contacts like uh, Air Optics, night and day, night and day in a pure vision, toric, may really work very well, like in this case of two diopters of post uh, six solar stigmatism, just corrected with the appropriate contact lens. The other type, and we're already going more into the specialty lens feeds, it's what called uh, soft mini sclerals, and then you will see why I call them mini sclerals, or just very thick post soft contacts for keratoconus. So, this lens is basically fitted almost like a normal scleral lens. You're trying to minimize your apical touch. And again, the picture on the right, it, it is a fluorescent pool underneath, beneath the soft lens. It's not a scleral lens. This material is completely soft, as you see here with the finishations. So this big soft lens is rest over the uh, paralimbal sclera and partially, partially over the limbus, but basically still overcoming, vaulting the limbus again, as I will say, similar to the big, the big brother of scler real scleral lens. Lens thickness, which may go up to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 millimeters, is, and, and, and the rigidity of the material, because again, the thicker we go on the center thickness, the more rigid surface we'll create. Uh, help to create tear lens and regularize the cornea underneath. A few examples, uh, mostly, as far as I know, it's three companies that are doing that. It's uh, Softflex, which now is Cooper Vision, Novacon by Alden, and, and Flex Lens by, by Excel here in Georgia. So, Speaking again a little bit more about this mini soft mini sclerals or silicon hydrogel mini sclerals, it's large lens, it almost goes up to 17 diameter and it's a very thick lens again, staying over the paralimbal cornea and, 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 and sclera and vaulting the sinal treated part. And this lens again, this lens may create a small very thin pool of tears beneath it. And I'm just trying to see if you can see this video. Yes. So you see, it, it, it's moved. It's still not a rigid scleral lens, but it's by the side, it's almost like a scleral lens. It has this little fenestration added to it just to improve oxygen delivery because again, it's pretty thick lens overall. And uh, this top is for taking after cross link without having this lens in and over the lens. So the center, it's almost spherical. See, it just goes from 47 diopters in the inferior part, it goes to 40. And so it basically creates very, very little amount of astigmatism, uh, causing marked, marked improvement in, 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 in patient, patient visual, visual acuity. Uh, the second go to Lens probably will be hybrid lens, which is basically a combination, as you see from its name, of the rigid and soft material. So this hybrid lenses have a rigid button in the center made out of very highly permeable uh, GP material surrounded by a soft scar. There's many different times and its types of this lens is still evolving the most uh, the newest one, the most recent one, probably is Ultra Health in Duet from Synergize. It's also a you know, company in France that doing a very similar type of hybrids, but they're not available here in the US. It works very well over mild and cell cones, providing visual beauty very similar to rigid contact lenses. 
but unfortunately it's not complications free. So again, it's, as you see, it's very similar to the picture with scleral lens, some pulling of tears in the center, and then the lens actually rests with the, when the RGP ends, it basically rests over the cornea, but it actually skipping any contact with the treated zone. And the biggest thing again of the last years is scleral lenses, uh, which work for basically any type of a surface, but they, uh, they work especially well over compromised of the surface because again, having this protection, protective and vaulting effect, not having any contact uh, with central cornea and also having no limbal contact, contact they actually help to uh, improve this remodeling process because again, when you rest your lenses over the limbus, you're actually still disrupting the normal epithelial uh, migration from the limbus to the center. So not covering the cornea completely and not interacting with uh, this epithelial cells migration probably will be the best thing to do. Uh, some again, many different types. And again, most of the sclerals, the mini sclerals, which is up to 17 millimeter in diameter, they work again very well for central type of and not very steep cones. There's some limitations again in terms of adhesion and, and, and conjunctival vessels, uh, disruption and blanching. And again, everything could be fixed. Sometimes we use little fenestrations to bed to the lens to provide better oxygen flow and decrease in breaks adhesion or just making the lenses larger, covering throughout the larger area. So uh, the fitted definitely should be, should have sufficient wall towards the cornea trying to avoid any contact with the treated zone. And as you may see on this video, it also may move a little bit, but you see very, very nice pool of fluorescent underneath the lens. And if you do have a scleral lens with some manual movement, it actually may facilitate the ventilation underneath the contact lens. So it actually helps to make this fit more physiological. Full size scleral lenses, uh, may every type of corn may be fitted. So again, if you see corneas at more than 60 depth or in center stiffness over the maximal K point, I will definitely recommend to start at least with 18 millimeter lenses. So uh, cor no corneal duct contact is definitely our way to go after the cross link. And I will just show briefly results of one of the studies we did on different types of, of special lenses after the cross link, which included soft mini sclerals, hybrids and sclerals. And most of the patients were able to tolerate these lenses very well. In a group of scleral lenses, of soft sclerals, eight eyes with, with K max of 55, which definitely puts it already in the advanced group, a moderate and vascular keratoconus were able to achieve 20 over 40 vision. So that's mean even as a temporal retainer lens, the soft lenses may work very well till the cornea goes to its more stable shape. Uh, definitely in scleral lenses, the best to their uh, optical properties. And also something we will touch a little bit later. Uh, most of the eyes go and uh, it's almost 50% in our group go and, uh, and uh, undergo some degree of corneal flattening, which has to be addressed with the proper lens fitting. And Oh, excuse me. So in terms of safety, all patients already the the lens as well. Uh, some of them stop using the lenses in, in, in uh, soft lens and hybrid lens group due to uh, complications like corneal erosions and uh, not good lens weighting, which will which may happen with soft type of silicon silicon materials, scleral lens group didn't show any type of feet or corneal related complications. Hybrid lenses uh, should be, should be fitting them with more precaution because again, because of the settling effect and very often you will see this type of a skirt or ring erosion over the cornea again, mostly happens 
uh, when the lens settles back significantly and start basically resting over the cornea and when it is a subscar collapse you can also see uh, some degree which is very very marked here of central type of erosions so just be more careful when you feed hybrid contacts and uh, having this type of an impression rings or circular erosions it's actually bad for proper epithelial remodeling and not just that it also opens the window for any possible microbial keratitis so always try to wait at least two hours before you evaluate our hybrid contacts because of this scarred flattening and, and compaction effect and this lens is also may have because of this skirt pressure effect or landing zone pressure effect this lenses also may have some influence over the uh, corneal geometry causing molding and and significant corneal flattening like in this case and again, it's not crosslink related it's basically corneal rigid rigid part of the lens related so again just extra caution should be taken fitting uh, hybrids so what is our proposed paradigm in, in fitting uh, specialty lenses after crosslink? Usually wait for at least a month. Again, it's definitely healing dependent, but at least a month before we start with uh, contact lens fitting. Some patients who really cannot tolerate bad vision, we may start it a bit, a bit earlier, but our go-to lens will be the soft scleral lens. Again, due to its very gentle properties, not, not disrupting epithelial remodeling. And then we reevaluate the patient in three to four months. And if cornea shows signs of stabilization, we will definitely advise, advise scleral lens feeding. And it may be any variable design you, you feel comfortable with. Uh, and surprisingly, many of the patients will prefer to stay with the soft mini scleral because again, due to convenience, uh, they're not limiting to any special tools or, or special lens treatment as uh, scleral lens or hybrid lens may require because these soft mini sclerals work basically as a normal soft lens. So after crosslink, uh, we have the stage of the cornea that goes through a series of beam mechanical changes is the surface may be uh, compromised by both procedure and previous contact lens use and may show signs of delayed healing. Steeper corneas may take longer to recover in terms of both proper revitalization or proper remodeling. And it seems that scleral lenses uh, both soft and rigid will be more viable option for post crosslink cornea. And again, our aim again is to minimally interfere with normal corneal recovery after the procedure. Now, the question number two. So, what do you think seems to be the best fitting scenario in the first one to two months after corneal crosslinking? Is it waiting for not doing any contacts for two or three months till carrying down to the pretreatment levels or starting rigid contact lenses as soon as possible to improve the A because patient cannot see well or like a step fitting approach when you start with a specialty soft lenses first and then slowly move to hybrid and scleral lenses. And, yep, yeah, that's correct. The correct answer is C. Yep, I'm sorry. Yep, the correct one is C. So, I believe we still have a few more minutes left. So I just wanted to speak briefly uh, about scleral after crosslink and maybe touching a little bit what we do when we're fitting kids after crosslink that we definitely do more and more. So when you fit a patient with scleral lens, how exactly do you 
do you think it will change the the corneal shape because basically the scleral lens stays over the cornea does not touch it so why we should expect any should we expect any changes to the corneal shape as uh, after wearing a rigid regular lens and again the same question should be asked how do we monitor the progression of keratoconus so how do we monitor success of cross-linking if patient is wearing is clear lens and if it doesn't have any influence on the cornea or it does. So I will just go very briefly. All of you know that clear lens is it's a, it's a big thing now and uh, almost like it, especially in the US, like 30% of practitioners, even three years ago, already been using sclerals to address keratoconus. And again, how do we monitor the progression if it's this? type of exchange going from 48 to the center to 44, you see contact lens or not contact lens related. And in this case, it's actually a scleral lens relate, related. And again, very similar, this cornea variant from 50, 50, I think to 55, sorry for bad quality of imaging. It's a very well fitted lens with no corneal touch, but it still gets flatter. So, uh, another example, I baseline this cornea was 43, and then after starting sclerals, it actually got steeper. And as you see on, on the right, is a, is a difference map, so it shows some superior steepening, and then we, we discontinued sclerals for two weeks, and cornea well went back to free fitting uh, measurements. So it still is clear lens effect. Uh, in this case, it's actually different. It's a, it's a cross-linking related flattening, which mostly will happen. So it's sometimes it's very, very hard to differentiate, but it probably mostly will happen in the center with this type of flattening than with the flattening clear lens related, it will be more superior or peripheral. So again, how do we differentiate and how do we follow up on progression if in sclerosis wearers? And I, I'm just in terms of in terms of time, I will just skip a few of the slides. But again, we just did a study fitting seven eyes with keratoconus after crosslink and seven eyes with keratoconus without crosslink with scleral contacts. All of them received very similar contacts in terms of contact lens size, and uh, none of the contacts uh, showed any type of a corneal touch. So if the, the, fit, the fit was uh, assessed by uh, anterior, uh, anterior or CT to verify there is no corneal contact. And in both groups, in both groups, the cornea got flatter after two hours and more significantly after five hours underneath the scleral lens. And again, we're talking about good fitted lenses with no corneal contact, but it still gets flatter. And again, there was some difference between cross-linked eyes and non-cross-linked eyes, but again, all of them show this type of corneal flattening. So definitely scleral lens has a uh, flattening effect of the cornea. And these few uh, approaches that we thought to, to influence this, this flattening, it might be epithelocinic related because of the fluid forces underneath. Uh, again, scleral lens, most of the mini sclerals are sealed lenses, so it basically no, no liquid exchange underneath. So basically, negative pressure of the liquid may cause this type of flattening. Others thought it's corneal swelling. Uh, cornea still will swell, or even so it's physiologically acceptable and you won't find any corneal edema in this size, but it still swells for by about 1.5 to 4%. In our study, it was 1.7% of corneal swelling and swelling is definitely associated with corneal flattening. This is probably the most uh, reliable mechanism uh, in, in, in what we think on uh, that causes this corneal flooding. Uh, blinking forces through the contact lens also may cause it. It's like a pumping effect of the liquid underneath the lens. Uh, so, 
again, just to emphasize, Scarland is a good thing. It's probably the best fitting scenario after cross-linking, but still it has its side effects, making the uh, fallout a bit more difficult, and we still need to remove these lenses to allow for proper corneal imaging uh, when we have to decide about the procedure or when we just do our normal follow-up after the procedure. So the lenses definitely should be discontinued. Uh, if we do recommend seven days of, in best case scenario, of course, of discontinuation, very often just impractical because patient cannot rely, uh, cannot function properly, not having a good vision in, 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 in even in one eye. So very often we just recommend maybe doing one eye at a time, stop, stopping the wear on one eye and then doing scans and then resuming the lens wear and going back. And our question number three, may scleral contact lens cause colonial molding and flattening similar to rigid contacts, which is false, true, or uh, depends on the amount of corneal clearance underneath the scleral lens. And of course, Yes, uh, and of course, yes, I will say it's mostly B because if you sure our study, if you remember our study results, all, 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 all the lenses were fitted with very similar corneal clearance, uh, up to 300 microns, and there was no strong association in between amounts of clearance and corneal flattening. So it's mostly, most of the eyes still will get flatter underneath the square lens. And again, just will show a few complication pictures, which also may happen under bandage contact lens. So this infiltrates its early Illy fitted bandage lens related. You see the lens margins over here. We just, and it barely, barely covers the cornea. So again, the cornea is so stiff that basic BCL won't cover it sufficiently. Soft lenses, specialty soft, also not complications free. A lot of limbal compressions and SPKs. It also may have very poorly vetted surface causing significant vision disruption and fluctuations, again, because of the higher percentage of uh, silicon in these materials. So you should address first ocular surface and treat dry eye. A large diameter GP because it do, do not move because dimple veil, is, which is very benign, but still changes the shape of the cornea. And we're often putting a small fenestration will help to improve oxygen delivery. And hybrids again, even so, it's scleral lens type of contact lens in terms of corneal clearance, but even having good clearance over the center, you still will find some significant lens impact very often. Be careful and always remove hybrid lenses when you do your posterior lens fit evaluation. And sclerals are also not complications free. In game depends on the feet, and it's more common this type of compression rings and erosions. More common with these mini sclerals when you don't have a sufficient distance in between the lens and the cornea battles back over the time. And I think it's just a nice picture to conclude with. Uh, it's a keratoglobic, keratoglobic cornea with very bad vision and unfortunately no PK is possible due to both very, very thin cornea. You probably think it here. This cornea is most vastly neovascularized, almost 360 degrees over the thinnest point. So it's, it's no option for PK. So this cornea under red trust transepithelial cross-linking uh, without scraping and then was fitted with a scleral lens, which <laughs> Drastic, drastic improvement in visual acuity. And uh, we also use this contacts in pediatric. We, we, we definitely fit scleral lenses in cases of uh, pediatric keratoconus. And it might be a bit challenging due to age. 
And you know, this, most of these kids who show up to the clinic with very bad, very severe degree of recon. So as opposite to adult care, the kind of pediatric you see, it's very severe. He may develop just like in a few, I will say, sometimes we see cases that got steeper by five days up to in two months. Most of them have allergy. Most of them are eye rubbers. So everything we can do to stop eye rubbing. It's definitely the patient very much appreciated. But um, anyway, anyway, such in this case, very in cornea, this kid underwent contact lens assisted cross link and was able to get good vision with sclerals. And we also did again short study uh, on our pediatric patients. So uh, with a mean age of 12 years. So some of them use contacts for surface disease indications, but 12 of them use con scleral, scleral contacts for keratoconus visual rehabilitation. And in this group, six eyes already were after cross link. And all of them showed very, very good acceptance rate and also uh, decrease in both K stiff and K flat uh, readings. So again, probably again, the cross link in scleral lenses is the biggest, is the, is the next coming thing, and this is the best treatment we can offer our patients. But again, you know, the question if patients can afford the scleral lenses, because uh, some of them won't just, is it, the cost is still high, and I guess it's high world, worldwide, and some of them just don't have an appropriate insurance to cover for these expenses. Okay, so again, we talk about it, and my final slide. Uh, it's always a challenge to feed keratoconic patients. It's definitely a time consuming procedure with multiple visits. It requires many design change, and uh, even with best fitted lens, sometimes the comfort and vision may be variable, and there's definitely an expenses. Uh, behind our uh, specialty lenses in, in these cases. But still, we have the procedure now that can break this lifelong circle of bad vision, and, 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 and especially again in pediatric patients, if we can stabilize their corneas when they're still young and put them in scleral contact, they might need to not require PK never and they keep using these lenses for good and who knows what technologies will, will evolve in next years. So, a uh, so question about the age limit. Uh, basically not. If the patient is co cooperative, Let me see, yes. So yes, basically not. if the patient is cooperative in male for for, 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 for cross-link uh, with topical anesthesia. Uh, we've done kids as young as eight years old. Some of them just need a uh, sharp sedation and they do fine. We also have experience with uh, kids with Down syndrome that can do cross-link even, even under topical. And to the next question. Uh, so some studies saying that the question about should the procedure should be repeated or not. Some studies saying it's about three to five percent that crosslink should be repeated because corneas still keep changing. It all depends on how fast this collagen fibrins turn uh, turn out rate. So the younger the patient, probably the collagen will uh, replace itself sooner. But uh, most of the studies show that in terms in terms of 10 to 15 years, the need for repeated crosslink was less than less than five percent. And a uh, question about uh, color and contrast sensitivity acuity, if it will be impaired. Uh, yes, it mostly happens due to post crosslink corneal haze, and most of the haze improves throughout the period of three to six months. And depends on the intensity of the haze. So some patients really need 
prolonged use of steroids for three to four months after the procedure just to, to, to decrease the inflammatory response. Some of them will definitely respond badly. Again, it's case patient related, but it, it, it's very uncommon having case for longer than six, six months. Uh, Ross-K lenses. Ross-K2 lenses, it's, it's, it's all about the same approach of mini, minimal optical clearance. I think if, if you can fit such a lens without having any heavy corneal impact and not seeing any SPKs or, or erosions underneath the lens, it, it will work. Uh, we very often recommend if, if it's, I see patients that basically didn't, it doesn't have any, any change to their K readings after the procedure, and still or cannot afford, let's say, changing the lenses, but the lenses, if it is still good, just go with piggyback lens for, for a few months. The, the daily, daily silicon hydrogels are uh, available, I believe, now everywhere, and it, it will just you know, make, make this fit safer, and some patients will just like the comfort in terms of protection as well. A question about three-point touch. So basically in three-point touch, you're trying to divide your lens plate over the peripheral cornea and uh, the center cornea, trying to minimize this impact. But again, the more need you touch the center, you eventually will cause some disruption to the epithelium. So again, the, uh, we think that the apical clearance will be still better in such cases. A uh, question about vernal conjunctivitis, vernal catar, uh, topical antihistamines. We, we use it a lot. I often put my pediatric patients when they just go through first fitting on any type of chromaline or, or, or olopatadine, uh, if available, uh, eye drops to do it for two weeks before they start with any contacts and they just continue doing it routinely. Because linking is contraindicated again when we don't have sufficient corneal thickness. If it's below 400 microns, again, with the APOP technique is contraindicated. If patient has severe uh, or significant stromal center scarring, it will be contraindicated. High drops, it's also one of the contraindications. And which technique of contact lens manufacturing works better. It's, it's not better in, in, in terms of better, uh, better what's better for the cornea to the cornea to the feet of the patient. It, it's, it's case to case related, but again, the less impact you can cause to the cornea, the better it is. The earliest indications that an optometry student can diagnose are uh, keratoconus, retinoscopy. If you have, if in, if you don't have uh, corneal topography in your clinic, you sh should still have retinoscope and keratometer. Both of them will show uh, unclear myers, like in terms of uh, ker uh, keratometry or distorted myers that won't change with the blink. And retinos retinoscopy will show scissoring type of reflex. So I, I still use my retinoscope now. Every time I see a new patient, it's diagnosed with keratoconus, keratoconus suspicion whatsoever. I always do retinoscopy. It's an incredible tool. Uh, how long to wait with rigid lens fitting? Again, the healing related, if you don't have any, any dryness over the treated area, if the K reading come back, to the pre-treatment level, you can definitely start with RGP. Again, we usually wait with RGP at least six weeks, if possible. And uh, we, so, if if the question about the role of scleral lenses after refractive surgery. Uh, we do it a lot in cases of coronal ectasia after refractive surgery and uh, hello. Sometimes we use, it's just evolving, it's a new technique. Sometimes we use uh, aberration 
using negative vibration on the front surface of the scleral lens to uh, counteract uh, positive spherical aberrations in case of uh, large pupils or descent, descent of treatment, but again, it's mostly corneal topography related, so each case should be addressed individually. Uh, corneal sclerotic equation about corneal scleral lenses, uh, it's, it's a good option. It's a, it's a good option. It definitely may be a good option months after cross-linking again when the cornea is already healed uh, before trying sclerals. Some patients will have lesser tolerance to corneal sclerals because again the edge lift effect but again if the cornea is not too steep, if it's not too vaulted, uh, it will stay good. So some of the corneal sclerals, it's a, when you're going to very steep bases to fit over this very steep cornea, it just will make this lens to, to adhere to the cornea and it will stop moving. So it will be getting the seal type of a fitting and then you have to move to the scleral lens. And yes, it might be, in terms of visual acuity, it might be better than soft sclerals. But again, we often see the soft sclerals as a interim, as an in-between option for the first few months just to have minimal impact over the eye, allow it to rip the lazar, rip the atel eyes, and then going and uh, feeding sclerals. And let's take one more. Oh, is it's a question about no rub, no corn. I think it's 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 true. I think it's true. You know, sometimes we just see. Uh, unilateral keratoconus even patient being sleeping on this, this on the particular side of their face for a long time. Yeah, it's, 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 I think it's it's all true. It's Dr. Gattinell, it's definitely nailed it. Uh, so again, question about scleral soft contacts. Uh, I think you mentioned before, you, you, you can get it from uh, Cooper Vision or Softlex, and you can get it from Alden, uh, which is Bachelomp now. Uh, also, yes, er, er, optic Storic, most of the cases will work. Er, 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 optic Storic, it's 14.5, so again, for not very severe cases, it, it will, for frost, very mild cases, in refraction, it's still possible. It, it, it may work just fine. If you find the patient has more than three diopters of corneal cylinder, probably it won't be the best option because it's, I think it probably goes to up to 2.25. Uh, Bush and lump lenses, so by affinity, may go. You can always, yes, the other option will be by affinity XR, which may go up to almost 4.25. 75 the doctor for stigmages, but it already has to be specialty made. So yeah, advanced keratoconus and cross link, uh, it will work as soon as corneal sickness allows. Yes, it definitely will work. Again, you should not have no scarring, no surface disease, and superficial sickness. Uh, mini scleral lenses and scleral lenses are basically size related. And I think I think it's a very good question about uh, keratoconus with limbal cell sem deficiency from venal conjunctivitis that requires keratoplasty. Uh, it's very hard to answer. So uh, I think it's more question to refer to cornea uh, people, but if you do, if you still have clear center cornea and patient is willing to wear scleral contacts, scleral contact lens will basically address both. It will address the surface of the surface disease and will most definitely improve the limbal stem cell deficiency. Just you know, having this protection effect and also vision, we very often feed sclerals in cases of uh, aniridia-related limbal stem cell deficiency or any type of uh, corneal injuries like toxic and injuries corneal burns. 
that have limbal cell cell deficiency, we feed them in sclerals to improve the surface, absolutely. And I think we are good with everything. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you for having me here. And you have my email. So if you're having other questions, please let me know. Thank you.